All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to continue talking about the benefits of scaling today. Uh, last time we went through gigahertz micromechanical resonators. We talked about uh, just some of the plain dimensional scalings that you can do to reach very high frequencies. And so this is just a little bit of review of what we did. Uh, we looked at just a vibrating string which has simple, simple supports, and we actually derived the resonance frequency for that. Uh, then we looked at what's normally made in a MEMS process, which is more like a clamp-clamp beam, like you're seeing right here. And we put down an equation for the resonance frequency, which depends on dimensional parameters, among other things, material parameters like Young's modulus and density as well. Uh, but you could see from these equations clearly that when you scale down dimensions, for example, you scale down the L in this case, the frequency goes up, and you can see because L is going by a square law, the frequency goes up in a hurry. Um, we talked a lot about scaling, uh, the consequences of scaling last time too, that if you scale too much in the length direction, you end up having problems with uh, uh, energy loss of the substrate, and we talked about a couple different ways to solve that problem, just changes in geometry, changes in how you support the structure. Um, and so all that we talked about last time, uh, this time I'm going to leave all of that behind and talk about another example where miniaturization uh, is able to, I suppose, give us orders of magnitude improvements in certain characteristics of an application, and that is an atomic clock. Okay, so there's a, a thing called chip scale atomic clock. Uh, where there was a lot of research done to take atomic clocks from huge sizes uh, to something that you can put into a portable system. And to say more about that, let me leave this mode of lecturing and go to this mode here. This is straight out of your module number two, uh, which was on the web uh, even last time. Um, so I'm going to go through this a little bit and say a few things about chip scale atomic clock. And so just a little bit of background on this. So what is an atomic clock? It, it, it's a clock, like your watch is a clock, like the clocks you have on your uh, bed, uh, headboard, and that sort of thing. Except this is just a lot more accurate than any clock that you'll ever have. Right, so this thing is the NIST F1 fountain atomic clock. And it's sitting in a room you can see at NIST in Boulder, Colorado. And you can see it consists of a number of different things. So, so, so this thing here is the physics package. Let's see if I animate what things are. No, I don't. Okay, so this thing here is what's called the physics package. It actually contains atomic gases that can be interrogated uh, to give out a very specific frequency. So any atom that you have is sort of can be given a characteristic frequency if you remember your quantum physics, which I'm sure you all do. Um, but this is containing gases. They're being interrogated. They're giving out a very specific frequency, and it turns out that that frequency is a constant of nature. Right? So it's a very stable frequency. So for example, we talked about resonators last time, right? These are mechanical structures that vibrate. They vibrate at a very specific frequency, and they're very, very accurate. They're very, very precise. Those are very stable frequencies. Uh, that, that's in fact how your quartz watches work, right? They're using a quartz vibrating uh, uh, mechanical structure that sets frequency for you, and that's why your watch can tell time fairly well. I'm saying fairly well because this thing can tell time a lot better than that. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Well, you'll no, not not really, because what you do is you're using this one gas, but you can surround it by buffer gases at the same time, and you need to actually to try to prevent problems with the system that I'll talk about in a second. Okay, but yeah, if you could have just a pure gas, you, you would like that. And in fact, the ones with just the pure gas are the most stable. Like, like this is a fountain atomic clock. What it's doing is it's taking the gases, it's throwing them up and letting them fall back down. And as they fall back down, they're being interrogated by lasers. Um, and I'll show you what I, I'll tell you what I mean by interrogation in just a second. But just to start off, right, this is a massive thing. The volume is 3.7 cubic meters. You can see the optics required for this on an optical table. You can see all sorts of instrumentation by this. All of this together makes this atomic clock. And just as a metric uh, for you, it consumes 500 watts of power. Okay? It's big and consumes a lot of power. That means it's not portable, of course. 
But look at how good it is. Its accuracy is on the order of 10 to the minus 15. Uh, its stability is on the order of 3.3 times 10 to the minus 15th per hour. And I'm not going to go into what accuracy and stability are. I guess I'm just going to say that this means after one second, the error in time that it's measured is 10 to the minus 15th. That means it'll lose one second every 30 million years. Okay, so your watch will lose one second how, how much time? Much less than that, right? Not bad, but much less than that, right? So why would you need things like this? Well, it turns out that in order to uh, uh, run things like GPS, for example, GPS is based uh, almost entirely on timing. Okay, so it's essentially, right, it locates you by timing how long it takes a signal to go from one satellite that's up in space. And it takes at least three satellites. Generally, you want four of them that can then triangulate your position. That's how GPS works. And so GPS works by time. And when you look into it, everything works by time. Okay? Our cell phones, all our communications, all of your electronics, there's some timer in there. And different applications need different degrees of stability in time. An atomic clock is one of the ultimate things that you can get. So there's your physics package. And so I guess I'll say a few things about the benefits of portable timing. Okay, so why is time so good? Better timing uh, helps us with communications. Okay, so you know that your communications, we talked about it, it all operates on frequencies. Well, frequency is time, right? They're really the same thing. The way that you tell time is you have a very stable frequency coming out and you count the number of zero crossings, right? And after a certain number of zero crossings that you count, that's time. In fact, the definition of time is based on an atomic uh, resonance, the cesium atomic resonance. And that's defined by how many oscillations of the cesium atom. So there's a certain number of oscillations of cesium atom equals a second. And that's the, the definition of one second. Okay? And so if you have better timing, uh, you have more stable frequencies. You have more efficient spectrum utilization. So, for example, you can communicate in much smaller amounts of spectrum, which means that uh, um, you know, if you have a limited amount of spectrum to communicate, and we do, right, at least for long-range communications, that's about 3 gigahertz. Some will say 6, but 3 is the most reliable, I suppose. Uh, and we divide that up, of course. And when you have a dropped call, why are you having a dropped call? So say you're on your cell phone and, and the call is dropped. What happened? What happened was you're in a cell where there's so many people trying to talk at the same time that someone else has taken your slot. Okay? And how does the phone system decide that, that someone else takes your slot? Well, sometimes there's not much it can do, right? There's too many callers. That other person has a stronger signal than you. You're gone. Okay? So that's how dropped calls occur. And that's all based on spectrum utilization. If we could utilize our spectrum much more efficiently, we can have a higher volume of calls, and the incidence of drop calls gets smaller. Okay, so just one example there. Other things like longer autonomy periods, uh, faster frequency hop rates, faster acquire of pseudo-random signals. Uh, this all has to do with superior resilience against jamming. And so usually in your benign commercial civilian type things, jamming is not that much of a problem. But actually it is. When you, use GP, when you lose GPS, usually you're jammed by something, by a cell phone or something like that. Okay, but there's other things that where jamming is important as well. Uh, I'm not going to mention too many of those things, but just these things help prevent jamming. And they all get better as your timing gets better. Okay, the other thing timing gives us is that for network sensors, right, if you... Now we're trying to make big networks of sensors. This is the next big thing in wireless, right? It's going to be sensors. They're going to be ubiquitous, right? They're going to permeate this room, we hope, or some of us hope, right? And that means what? That means you walk in the room, it knows it's you. You may or may not like that, but you may like that because suddenly it does everything you want. It turns the TV to the right channel, the radio or something like that. You don't even have to lift a finger, and it all happens automatically for you. There's a lot of nice things you could do with sensor networks, right? You, you drive into San Francisco, you're looking for a parking space on Friday night, you know, you spend a lot of time circling, looking for one. Well, if you had a sensor network, you, know, you could just look at a screen and boom, it tells you exactly where to go to find the parking space that's open. Okay, so there'd be a lot of nice things that sensors could give us. And the larger the network of sensors, the more the requirement on timing is going to be, right? Because things have to be synchronized in a big way. And so better timing allows you larger networks with longer autonomy. They don't have to communicate with a base station as often just to synchronize with all the rest of the sensors. 
And I already mentioned GPS, right? If we have better clocks, uh, first of all, you need fewer satellites to locate where you are. You have a higher jamming margin, means that it's tougher to jam you out. And the big thing is faster GPS acquire. So I don't know how many of you travel a lot, but if you get off a plane in a new city and say your phone has GPS, it takes your phone, well, not your phone, but say you have a GPS uh, uh, a unit, I suppose, like one of those Garmin things or something. It takes them quite a while to get a lock on you, to figure out that you're now where in San Diego instead of in Berkeley. Right? That takes some time, and that's kind of annoying. Right? You get your rental car. I don't know how many of you guys do this. I do this all the time. So. <laughs> but you get your rental car, and you wait for that lock to occur if you're going to use GPS to get where you're going. If you had an atomic clock or a much more stable clock, that lock would be instantaneous. Okay? Because again, what's happening is you're locking to a satellite. The lock is happening through a synchronization with a pseudo-random signal. And you can synchronize much faster if you have a better clock. Okay? So better clocks give you lots of things. They make a lot of things possible. And again, it's this type of clock that is one of the best clocks around. You'd like to have something like this, but in a watch size or something, a much smaller size. Okay? And so there was, there's a lot of research that set out to try to make such clocks. And some of the earliest results came from NIST, uh, who have that big atomic clock. So naturally, they're trying to make the small atomic clocks. But it's really uh, physicists getting together with MEMS researchers to create something that no one thought was possible before. And I guess this is kind of an interesting thing, right? Th this whole thing came about uh, with a workshop that occurred where you had some of the best atomic physicists at this workshop. Uh, brilliant guys, right? And then you had some stupid MEMS guys, including me, <laughs> right? And so stupid MEMS guys, not because we're dumb. We're just dumb when it comes to atomic physics, right, compared to the physicists, right? They know it inside out. And so what's interesting, and this is something you need to be careful of, right, that when you get good at what you're doing, you become very arrogant. Okay, it's almost natural that you become arrogant to some degree. And that's sort of where the physicists were. Okay, they were in a state of arrogance, right? They were sort of saying, Look, I've been working in this area for 20 years. What are you going to tell me? I, I'm telling you, you can't make this any smaller than it can be right now, right? which is that NIST F1. right? Because I've looked at the problem. We've looked at all different uh, angles of it. There's no way it could be smaller. Right? At the workshop, you take guys who know nothing about atomic physics but know a lot about fabrication and what you can do in MEMS. You put those heads together, and suddenly, oh, wait a minute. I didn't consider that you could actually do that. And suddenly it becomes possible to make these chip scale atomic clocks. So I guess the lesson learned here is that you know, knowledge is tragic to some degree. You're going to be, you're already knowledgeable. And with more years, you're going to be even more knowledgeable. But just be careful with that, right? Never think that you know everything. Because once you think you know everything, what are you going to use your knowledge for? Right? Most people use their knowledge to save themselves time which is kind of a horrible thing. Because if you think about it, when you do that, what you do is you derive something and you say, OK, that's impossible. I'm not even going to try that. Right? And then you don't try that. And then someone who's less arrogant right, derives the same thing and says, eh, it says that, but you know, maybe I'm not right. right. Tries it and then makes an important discovery. Right? So I guess that's just one little anecdote with this whole thing that I saw time and time again when I was out, when I was out at DARPA. So the program manager, what I did was I created a lot of new ideas by taking people and putting them together. And time and time again, you take the experts in whatever area, you take non-experts, you put them together, suddenly something becomes possible that the experts thought was impossible to begin with. Okay? So just a little bit, you know, while you, I don't know how far all of you are in your PhD careers, but just remember this. Never get too arrogant to completely dismiss an idea just because you derived it, right? You may be wrong no matter how good you are. Right. But anyway, this is what came out of that workshop, actually, after you know, a few million dollars or so. Uh, NIST was able to create this. So this is sort of the equivalent of the physics package. So if I go back here, right, that's the physics package right there. It includes these optics and this atomic cell. Um, this is the physics package that NIST made. And that's it next to a dime. Okay? It's not as good as the big physics package. Okay? So the big physics package has a stability on the order of 10 to the minus 15. But this thing is able to get a stability on the order of 10 to the minus 10. And eventually, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 uh, at one hour integration time. And so it just comes to show that there, when you shrink things down, 
you know, you, you lost a little bit of performance, right? You lost a little bit of stability performance, but you gained a lot in other performance parameters that arguably are more important, right? And so one of those performance parameters is size, right? Size went small enough to, to now this size here, which now allows you to carry this around with you. This can now go in your radio. It can now go into your GPS unit. Right? The, the other thing that you're not seeing here is power consumption went down enormously as well. So this, which is an early version of this chip scale atomic clock, consumes 75 milliwatts. Okay? And that's a lot less than 500 watts. So, and that happened just by making the thing smaller. Okay? Employing MEMS technologies to make this smaller. And so what MEMS technologies were used? Well, there was a, a technology that put the atomic cell together. Okay, this is all micro-machining that was done to create this cell that contains the cesium vapor. So it has to be held at a high temperature in order to keep it vaporized. That's where the power goes into this. That's where a lot of the 500 watts goes into for that large atomic cell. But what you're going to learn today is that when you shrink the size of something, the amount of power required to maintain a certain temperature just goes away very, very quickly. Okay, so scaling helps power consumption in a big way. And some of the other things you see in here are some other, you can argue, MEMS and photonic components. So there's a VIXEL, that's a photonic component. Uh, but then you have these lenses that were constructed using MEMS type machining technologies, very small lenses to fit into this thing, which is about the size of a rice grain here. And so you see a bunch of lenses, uh, this atomic cell, this VIXEL, all of this MEMS and photonics coming together to create this little system here. Yes. What's that? The stability in this context. What? What about the stability? What did you mean by the clock is stable by this curve? Yeah. So it's stable with respect to. Uh, this is a measure of its stability here. This ten to the minus ten, and so that's similar to what we said about this atomic clock here. So, well, it's actually more accuracy here, but you know, that means about one second, 10 to the minus 10. That's a little bit wrong. You actually have to integrate that over an hour, and it becomes 10 to the minus 11, in which case it's accurate to, you know, every one second it's off by 10 to the minus 11, okay, which means it's, you, know, you can't even detect that yourself. So, so it's extremely accurate. Um, if I knew what your watch was, say, if you, over an hour, right, your watch, I guess I should know this number, but I've forgotten what it is. I would say your watch will be on the order of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, or something like that. So this is many orders of magnitude better than your watch right now. And your watch is using a crystal oscillator. That's what your GPS units use. Uh, you know, for me, my cell phone, right, I have one of these. Well, I won't say what it is because I'm online here. But I have one of these phones, right, that has GPS on it. And so I was just in San Diego a couple weeks ago, and I'm driving down a road, and I'm on the right road that I'm supposed to be on, and suddenly it says, take a left on this street. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, I'm on the right street. Why is it telling me to take a left? Well, it's telling me to take a left because it thinks I'm in the street next to it, and it's trying to get me to the street that I'm already on. Right? And why is that? Because this oscillator isn't good enough. Its timing isn't good enough, so it actually is making an error in the position of my car. Right? So that's one thing. Cell phone oscillators are not as good as the oscillators on the dedicated GPS units like the Garmin's and that sort. So cell phones are off right now. Right? You'd like to have a better uh, oscillator in a cell phone. Why don't you? Because cell phone manufacturers are cheapskates. And for good reason, because they sell billions of, this, of these, right? Every cent is a lot of money to them. Yes? back in 2000, uh, well the program started in 2002. This was the program that I ran when I was at DARPA actually. So it started in 2002, the first clock, I would say this result was about 2003, sometime in 2003. Uh, now they've, they actually have these in production now. So that kind of tells you how long it takes from conception to an idea that's in production that's actually going into things. And what does it go into? Well there are some military things it goes into, but some of the more commercial things that it goes into are cell phone towers, for example. Right? So your cell phone towers, they all need to have an extremely good clock. A lot of them were using atomic clocks. Some of them can use oven-controlled quartz. But now a lot of them are going to use this because this is cheaper to build. It consumes less power even than the oven-controlled quartz stuff. 
Okay? And, you know, there's lots of applications for this. Uh, a lot of them probably no one wants to talk about or so. Okay? Um, and soon it'll hit your watch, right? So th they continue to make evolutionary improvements such that maybe the power consumption is low enough someday. You're going to have a, a clock that's, I don't know why you need one, <laughs> but you may have a clock or something that's that good. Uh, even, you know, I guess, you know, even, you know, for you guys, if you're doing measurements or so of circuits and that sort, you need an extremely good clock on your Agilent measurement instrumentation. And so if they could put one of these atomic clocks in those things for a cheap price, you would have much better ability to make much lower noise measurements, much more accurate measurements, et cetera. Okay, so there's a lot that this could do for us. Um, so I guess in this slide, I'm just trying to show that it is a resonance that this is operating on. All clocks are operating off of a resonance. It's a frequency. You count. That gives you time. Okay? And so this is just a picture of the atomic resonance uh, that sort of represents how this thing is working. There's an actual atomic resonance that you're locking into. This is an Allen deviation plot here. I'm not even going to try to explain to you what this is. This is integrated time. And so you might know that if you have an oscillator, if you run it long enough and you count all the cycles, and it's going to average all of that time, all of those periods, right? And so the accuracy of that time gets better uh, as you average for longer, but you'll notice not always. So, so it gets better as it averages noise. But then there are other drift mechanisms like aging, stress relaxation, temperature drifts or so that start making it worse with long amounts of time. This is where atomic clocks shine. They actually can go longer without these drift mechanisms coming in. Okay? And so the, the, the goal of that program in chip scale atomic clock was right here. And I could tell you by now, right now they're right here. Okay? So they beat that goal. And that's another lesson to learn too. That, I mean, at the beginning of this program was hilarious because at the first meeting, right, I was the program manager and people were coming after me saying, these are impossible goals, this is stupid, we should stop this program. A lot of people were saying that in the beginning, right? And, and you could still see people say that. When there's a new a BAA or something, which is a, a, a research announcement, it, it's a funding announcement from agencies, usually they come out and you look at the goals and people look at them and they say, that's stupid, no one can ever make that. Right? Everyone says that the first day it comes out, but four years later, it's done, right? And so that's another thing to, to think of. There's nothing, there's almost nothing that's impossible. Right? You may react and say it's impossible, but you better take a second thought at that because it probably is very much doable no matter what you think. Okay? At least that's the lesson that I've learned off of all this stuff. Oh, I guess I show that it's gone down to these goals. It's even better than this. This is still old data here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what I mean by this atomic resonance. So let's go back to your atomic physics and talk about some of this. So the frequency of an atomic clock is determined by an atomic transition energy. So what does that mean? So you know enough about atoms to know that you have a nucleus, you have electrons flying around those atoms. Well, in atomic clocks, you're looking for atoms that have a single uh, electron in its outer shell, right? What's called an alkali atom. Cesium is one of them, and cesium is one of the favorites that are used because of the energies between its transitions. Okay, so what do, I, what do I mean by energies between these transitions? Well, here's an energy band diagram here. All right, if I have this atom in this state right here where it's, it, the, the nucleus has a spin, the electron has a spin, um, and the, if they're both spinning in the same direction, then that energy corresponds to this level right here. Okay, I can put energy into the system in many different ways. Usually you're sh uh, shoving light into the system of the right wavelength. If I put light of the right wavelength into the system, I can push this electron to the next orbital. So it's going from that orbital to a higher orbital here. And there's an energy associated with that excitation. And the energy difference between that, uh, if you divide by Planck's constant, gives you a frequency. That is the resonance frequency of this atom. Okay? And it turns out that to excite it to this state, you have to give it light that is at a wavelength. 352 terahertz turns out to be 852 nanometers a wavelength that's the appropriate energy to excite this to the next orbital, okay? 352 terahertz is nice, right? We wish we could operate at those frequencies because, right, if you had to simulate anything, you would, there would be no wait time whatsoever, right? That's an extremely high frequency, but unfortunately, that's too high for us to play with right now, right? We don't have any transistors or any electronics that can work at this kind of frequency uh, reliably. 
Okay, so that's too high a frequency. So what do we need to do? We need to find a smaller energy transition where that smaller energy divided by Planck's constant gives us a smaller frequency. And we preferably want something in the gigahertz range. All right, well, it turns out that there are two different states in the ground state of this atom, right? You can have a, a state where the spin of the nucleus and the electron are in the same direction or a state where they're in opposite direction. Well, if they're in opposite directions, there's a different energy associated with that, and the energy difference between this is much smaller than that uh, between transitions to the next energy level. Divide that by Planck's constant, you get 9.192631770 hertz. That is the definition of the second. Okay, one second is that many oscillations of a cesium-133 atom. Okay, and so this is basically, you know, these atoms are giving us this frequency, and you know, this is frequency, this is a constant of nature, right? This was provided by nature, and so with a resonant beam like a guitar string, right? That's gonna change with frequency over time. Temperature will change it, stress relaxations will change it. This is not gonna change. Or, or at least it's not gonna change fast enough that we're gonna recognize it, probably the whole human civilization as long as it lasts. We're not gonna recognize that change if it is changing, right? So that's why the second is defined over this. It's a constant of nature. It's a very accurate reference for us. Um, so how do you take advantage of this? I just talked about atomic resonance, but the actual way to take advantage of this takes a little bit of know-how here. And so here's one rendition of how this is done. This is actually how it's done in a chip scale atomic clock. This is different than the fountain atomic clocks and cold atom atomic clocks that you may or may not know about. Uh, this is a simpler rendition. So what you have is, is a cell that contains your cesium vapor. You have to keep it as a vapor, so you have to heat it. And again, that's where a lot of the power consumption comes in this. You then take a laser, and you shine that laser through this vapor cell. Now this laser is gonna be at 852 nanometers going through, but it's not, uh, and so it's exciting these to another state. Uh, but this gas is fairly opaque to that laser because it's not in a hyperfine condition. Hyperfine condition is when you've excited it uh, to, the, uh, to the other state where you have, or you have a, a coherent condition where you have many more of one of the ground states than the other, okay? And so what you do on this thing is this is your carrier. I said it's 852. It's a laser shining through this. Some of the lasers getting through, your detector's picking that up, but not all of it's getting through because this looks opaque to the laser. You then come in with a microwave oscillator. This is pure electrical engineering here. You use a quartz crystal, hook that up with a microwave resonator, create an oscillator out of this, but one that's tunable. And if this oscillator is putting out 4.6 gigahertz, which is half of the hyperfine frequency, okay, then it creates modulation sidebands around this carrier. And the distance between, of course, the carrier and the modulation sideband is 4.6 gigahertz, but the distance between these sidebands is 9.2 gigahertz. That is the hyperfine frequency, right? So you're now putting energy into this cell at the right frequency to excite the hyperfine transition. You get that excitation you create what's called a coherent state, right, where the atoms become more transparent to the light. They let more of the light through. And so when your frequency is exactly equal to half the hyperfine frequency, you get a peak in your detector. Okay. Anytime you have a peak, you can lock to it, of course. Right? So you take this peak, you roll that back around to your oscillator to control the oscillator so now it's locked to exactly the atomic clock hyperfine frequency. And so if you take the output of the oscillator right here, you get a 4.6 gigahertz signal that is extremely stable. Okay, you could use that as your output, but generally people don't. Generally people will use the 10 megahertz output as the clock output, and that consumes some power to do that. But in the end, this is the way this atomic clock is made. It's very much you know, an electrical engineering construction with the, the physics cells, et cetera. Uh, but it's very small, right? People have made atomic clocks like this before in a larger size. But what was done in this research effort was to make it much, much smaller. And so to make it a chip scale atomic clock, you take that atomic clock concept, but you miniaturize it all into this size. And the goals of the program were actually to get a volume of less than a cubic centimeter, okay? a, a power of 30 milliwatts, so compare that to 500 watts, 
and a stability of 1 times 10 to the minus 11, which is not as good as the atomic clock, which was on the 10 to the minus, the, 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 the large atomic clock was 10 to the minus 15, uh, but that's overkill, right? This is good enough to revolutionize a lot of different things, okay? But doing this is not an easy thing, right? Doing this, you have to understand the concepts you'll learn in this class. And the key challenges here were thermal isolation to get lower power. So one of these things is this power goal here. How do you get to that power goal? Uh, the other thing is cell design for maximum quality factor. So we talked about atomic resonance. Well, atomic resonance is the same as uh, beam resonances or LC resonances. You can define a quality factor. That's energy divided by energy dissipated per cycle. Uh, the, the final thing was the low power microwave oscillator. It's something that still hasn't been solved for CSAC. So CSAC doesn't really meet 30 milliwatts of power unless you allow a 4.6 gigahertz output. With a 10 megahertz output, most of these are at 100 milliwatts of power. Still a lot smaller than your oven controlled oscillators, uh, but we'd like it to be smaller. As reference, your watch oscillator is consuming less than a nanowatt of power. <laughs> So right, you're probably not going to give that up to have one of these things, no matter how accurate this is. Um, so what about this issue about keeping the Q of the cell high enough? Okay, so this is an interesting issue. I want to talk about it because this, this sort of gives you the pros and cons of scaling. Okay, so think of what's needed to create this atomic clock. You have to take this vapor cell. Okay, all this vapor cell is, is is a box. It's a glass box that contains atoms that are in a vapor state. So these atoms are bouncing around, right? And these atoms, they're gonna hit the wall every now and then, right? And so I talked about the, the hyperfine transition state, right? That's called coherent population trapping. That is a, that's a coherent state of all the atoms. Okay, if an atom hits a wall, it loses that coherence. And so you're losing that coherent state and so what happens is if you can model the atomic resonance by this very sharp peak with very high Q, as you get these collisions, the Q is lowered and the performance of your clock is not as good. Okay? So people knew this before the program started and this is why the physicists were coming in saying, okay, it's baloney. Right? There's no way you can make this smaller because we understand that it's these wall collisions uh, that are limiting the performance of your clock. If you make your clock too small, you're going to get too many wall collisions. And why would they say that? They're going to say that because think about scaling this now a thousand times. This is about what chip scale atomic clock was trying to do. Okay? When you scale something, what happens? Okay, so you're going to scale it. The surface to volume ratio goes up. Think about it. Right? If I have something very large, the volume is very large. Right? But the surface area is a certain amount. I scale this. Volume goes as dimension cubed. Right? Area goes as dimension squared. So in the end, area is not going to shrink as fast as volume will. So surface to volume area goes up. And it goes up very fast when you're scaling something down. If your surfaces now are, your surfaces now look a lot bigger to these atoms, right? And so you get many more collisions as this thing shrinks. And so those many more collisions cause people to conclude that, hey, you know, you're going to lower your Q even more, and your atomic clock will be terrible. You will put all this effort into making an atomic clock, and it will not work. Well, it'll work, but it'll be as, just as good as a quartz crystal, and no better, right? And so that was one of the things where people were saying this is impossible. But if you really look at this a little more closely, right, so this is the part of engineering away the problems with going smaller. Okay, you engineer it away, and one way to engineer it here is you put in a buffer gas. Okay, so instead of just having the atoms themselves in there, you put in a buffer in that so that the atoms no longer impact the walls. Some of them are impacting the buffer, and the buffer is a gas such that that impacting collision does not deface the atom nearly as much as a wall collision would. Other, other solutions to this are wall coatings or so to try to allow the atoms to keep their phases. But this was just one solution that really worked. Okay, this allowed us to return back, even in these tiny cells, to uh, a state where you can keep your coherence, keep the very sharp Q of the atomic cell, and therefore retain the performance uh, versus what a macroscopic cell could. Okay? So again, some people too quick to say this is impossible, others not as quick, 
think about it a bit, come up with a solution. All right? But why go through all this trouble to get this small cell? Well, size was one of the things, but power is an even bigger one. Okay, so let's talk about this power thing. And let me do it by comparing the macro scale with the micro scale. We're going to do this in much more detail than this, but this is just the overview picture. Okay, so this is sort of starting one of our major areas, which are thermal circuits. This is an area where I could talk about scaling things, but at the same time, talk about modeling a mechanical or thermal system now with an electronic circuit uh, to make your math a lot easier. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a macro scale uh, atomic cell. So this is your atomic cell. So this brown, let's say, is glass. Uh, this cylinder in there, let's say, is an opening in that glass that contains uh, the, uh, the atoms. This pink thing going through is supposed to be the laser. Okay, and you can see that a typical cell, maybe it's on feet, rubber feet, I'll say in this case glass feet or so, and then it's on top of uh, some chassis, which we can say is at room temperature, 25 degrees. Okay, to keep the vapor in the atomic cell at 80 degrees C, you have to put heat in. Okay? And so that's one side of it. Okay, on the other side, we have the micro scale, which, of course, if you compare them directly, you wouldn't see the micro scale one. But if I zoom in on this, it's going to look something like this. Okay, the first thing that impacts you is, boy, that looks a lot different than the thing on the right. Okay, it looks a lot different because on the micro scale, there's things you can do that you just can't do on the macro scale. And that is support things with much thinner and longer uh, supporting tethers here. Okay, so this is supported on feet because it has to be. This is supported on these long tethers, and it turns out this is going to be a big reason why the atomic clock can operate with much less power. So we're going to maintain this also at 80 degrees C, but all these dimensions are a lot smaller. So this could be a 300 by 300 by 300 micron cell versus this 3 centimeter by 3 centimeter by 3 centimeter cell on the macro scale. Okay, it's all going to come down to modeling this thing with a thermal circuit. It turns out that both of these things, even though they look so different, can be modeled by a very simple circuit that is just an RC circuit. And then the power that goes into heat this can be modeled by a current source. And it turns out that the resistance associated with these systems here is equal to the support length divided by the cross-sectional area. So the longer and the thinner you can make those supports, uh, which scaling allows you to do, the uh, larger this resistance can become. Okay? The thermal capacitance is related to the volume of the different entities. And so obviously you can get a lot smaller thermal capacitance on the micro scale. And so in the end, when you do all the math, what you find is that on the macro scale, you get thermal resistances on the order of 38 Kelvin per watt is the unit. Uh, thermal capacitance is on the order of 20 tool, joule per Kelvin is the unit. On the micro scale, look at the orders of magnitude difference here. 83,000 Kelvin per watt and much smaller thermal capacitance, 10 to the minus 6 joule per Kelvin. Okay, if you do the math, you find that what this means is that on the macro scale for this cell, which is a lot smaller than that huge atomic cell that I showed, right? So it's going to be less power. Uh, but to keep it at 80 degrees, 1.5 watts are required. To get it to 80 degrees from a cold start, 16 minutes is the time constant. So about three times that is how long you'll have to wait for that to settle to 80 degrees C. Okay, that's another problem with these large atomic clocks. They take a long time to settle. It's a problem that you may experience with Agilent instrumentation. Right? If you're going to make a measurement, uh, do you just turn on the instrument and, and start measuring immediately? I bet you do. But if you do that, you're compromising your stability. Right? Usually for these things, if they have oven-controlled oscillators, you have to wait at least 30 minutes or so for that oscillator to stabilize. Then you can make the lowest noise measurements. Then you can make the best measurements. Okay? You should wait if you want to make a good measurement. Okay? And, and the reason why you're waiting is this. Right? There's a heater in there. It's taking time to heat everything up. There's a thermal time constant associated with that heat. Okay? On the micro scale, what happens? 2.6 milliwatts needed now to get that 80 degrees C. The time constant is 0.1 seconds. Right? In less than a second, that thing's ready to go. Okay? So that's another beauty of the atomic clock as well. Because with the atomic clock, you could save power by even just keeping it off and then turning it on when you really need to use it. 
and it'll settle very fast. In the end, right, this is 550 times lower power and uh, 7,300 times uh, faster warm-up time uh, than the macro scale. So huge gains, and all we did was make the thing smaller. Okay, so just another illustration of how smaller is a lot better. Is that a question? Yeah. ADC, well, you have to be at least that to keep the cesium in a vapor state. Yeah, but that's a good question because, you know, what happens, you know, in some applications, you'll go up as high as 125 degrees C, right? Then your oven control is not going to work. So in the end, ADC is where this program was specced, but the practical requirement is to have it up at 125 degrees C, okay? Only because that's the highest temperature you're probably going to work at in some applications. Um, okay, so people did this, right? So the NIST atomic clock that I showed that was consuming 75 milliwatts of power, right? Because it was not suspended, it was not well thermally isolated. Here's work by Draper uh, together with uh, um, Symmetricom. It's actually Symmetricom who's selling these atomic clocks now. And what they've done was they've taken this uh, physics package right here and are now suspending it by these. Uh, tethers you can see there. They're made out of capton, so they're very high, th they have a high thermal resistance, and now only five milliwatts of power is needed to get this up to 80 degrees C. Okay, so this really does work, and let's now get into the math of how this works. Okay, so let's look at this in detail, because I consider this a pretty important thing for you to know how to do. So this is going to be an example of uh, circuit modeling of mechanical systems. So I'm going into uh, writing mode now. All right, so here's that physics package. And let's first say a few things about this physics package. I already, I already described it to you, but let me write down a few more details that you're going to need to know. Uh, to do this analysis. So first off, uh, let's assume that everything is in vacuum. Okay, that way we don't have to worry about um, convection, heat loss due to convection, okay, which could be significant in this case. So let's make this simplifying assumption. Okay, and by assuming this, it allows us to neglect convection methods for heat loss, and it allows us to consider only conduction. The reason why I want to do this is because I want to keep this problem more linear. Once we get the convection and even radiation, we're talking about nonlinear type circuit elements, which can be handled. I mean, transistors are nonlinear circuit elements themselves. Uh, but I just want to keep it simple for now. A um, couple other things. So I have one dimension given there. That's three centimeters. Let's put some other dimensions on this. Let's say that it's a box. It's just three centimeters by three centimeters by three centimeters. So this dimension here will be three centimeters. Uh, this dimension here, which is the height, is also three centimeters. Uh, let's assume that everything is made out of glass. Okay, so the whole thing is glass, including the feet. So the cell is glass. The feet are glass. And so why do I want to do that? Because that means I can just uh, use a single set of constants for the materials that we're about to work with. Um, you see the laser going through this, but the laser's not heating this up. Uh, so let's assume that this is being heated up by a heater resistor. Okay, and the heater resistor may be something that just comes in like this, and then goes through sort of the center of this with winds and comes out. So it's really just a coil. Okay, so this is my heater resistor.
And let's say that it is at the bottom of this thing. Okay, so it's located at the bottom of this thing, right in the center of the thing. Okay? That's not where I would really put it, but I'm just putting it there to make the analysis simpler. Okay, I would probably put it at the top to keep it as far away from the feet as possible to keep the power down. Um, and so what can I, what else do I want? I want to give you constants for glass. So first of all, glass is going to have a few interesting constants that we want to uh, uh, worry about. So first of all, the density of, of this glass that we're using, it, we're going to say is 2,500 kilograms per meters cubed. Okay. There's a constant C sub P that we'll talk about in a second. That's a specific heat. That's 0 0.5 uh, joule per gram Kelvin. And there's another constant, the thermal conductivity, a K glass, is 1.05 watts per meter Kelvin. Okay. So that's kind of just defining the problem for you. And we want to analyze this problem. So what I want to know is how much energy is required, how much power is required to maintain this at 80 degrees. Okay, I'm also interested in how fast I can get this to 80 degrees from a cold start. Cold start meaning room temperature, which is here. This is what I'm going to call T naught, which is sort of my ambient temperature, the chassis temperature. Okay, before I can do this, I need to define a few things for you. So let me skip a few slides ahead here and just start defining uh, some stuff. So first of all, a lot of what we're going to do is just like electrical resistance and electrical capacitance. So I just want to put everything in perspective first by just reviewing something that all of you should know very well. And that's the concept of, of electrical resistance and capacitance. Really, resistance is what I'll look at here. Okay, and then we'll attack the analogy where we define a thermal resistance. Okay, so what is electrical resistance? So if I have a material like a conductor material, and everything is conductive to some finite amount. So maybe just a slab of this material like this, okay? This is going to have a resistance across it, right? Even a dielectric is going to have some finite amount of resistance. It could be huge, uh, but it's still going to have some, right, if it's a practical material. And so in this, I can define a couple things. So first of all, this thing is going to have some dimensions. So let's call this dimension the length, L. So I'll define that as its length. And as usual, I'll define this as its thickness, H. And this, of course, is going to be its width. Okay. And so this has a resistance associated with it. And so I guess I'll just there's your resistance going across that. And the value of this resistance, that's electrical resistance. And we call that R sub E to distinguish it from the thermal later on. That's going to be equal to the length of this thing divided by sigma divided by the area, where sigma is electrical conductivity, a constant. that you should all know very well. And this area is just this cross-sectional area here. So the area is just equal to H times W. Let me be specific and call this cross-sectional area. OK, so that's pretty much the definition of the resistance as long as this thing is uniformly conductive with this constant conductivity sigma. OK? Now, and associated with this, I could also define a capacitance. If I have, say, a plate underneath this, so say underneath this I have a plate maybe of the same size as this thing here, I'm going to have a capacitance with this. 
and that capacitance I'm going to call C and that's just going to be equal to whatever the permittivity is between these two things if it's an air gap that's going to be the permittivity of vacuum which is epsilon naught um, times W times L which is the uh, uh, area of overlap between those two capacitances divided by D where D is just the distance between the bottom of that conductor and the capacitive plate underneath it. So why am I even showing capacitance here? Uh, I guess I just want to say that capacitance, right, is your energy storage element. Right, so this represents storage of ener energy. So let me just say stores energy. And in this case, charge energy. Energy is a big concept we'll work with later on. And a lot of you know that the amount of energy it stores is going to be one half CV squared equals E, where this voltage here is just the voltage across the capacitor. Okay? So we have this capacitance, we have this resistance, and when you want to make a model for this, because it's got both capacitance and resistance, usually the simplest model we can give it that is reasonably accurate is something like this, where we take that total capacitance. Let's uh, be specific about this one, too, call that electrical capacitance. So we take that total electrical capacitance, put it in shunt in a T network, and then take the electrical resistance and put half of it on both sides of this capacitance. Okay, so that's a simple model for this thing, especially if this was somewhat distributed, if it had distributed conductivity around it. If it were distributed, I would probably want to divide this up. So, for a distributed sigma in this block, I would take this block like this, and I would divide it into sections. And then for each of these sections, whoops, I would give it its own little circuit like this. And so on and so forth for the rest of those. Okay? So that's how you would model this in the electrical domain. And I think a lot of you know this already, especially the EEs. I don't think this is too foreign a concept for the EMEs. Because, uh, you know, this is like finite elements, right? You're just dividing up this thing into little sections and you're representing it by circuit models here. Okay, transmission lines are no different. Transmission lines are inductor capacitor T networks. Okay? And so why am I showing you all this? I'm showing you all this because we're going to be able to do exactly the same thing in the thermal domain. Okay, so let's now talk about thermal circuits. So again, from our thermal circuit, what are we trying to model? Well, oftentimes, especially in MEMS, we're taking a look at beam structures like this. Okay, not really much different than uh, what we just talked about. And this beam structure, again, will have a certain length L, that's going to have a thickness H, a width W. I'm going to be able to take all of this stuff in here, define that as a cross-sectional area A, which is just going to be H times W. And I'm going to be able to define some parameters for this as well. And so the first one I'll define is a thermal capacitance. Right. Thermal capacitance, which I'll call CTH, is just equal to the density of the material times the volume times this specific heat that I introduced a little bit before. Okay, so that's density. That's volume. And that's specific heat, where specific heat is just a constant. Okay. 
is very similar to the permittivity constant that we had defined up here, right? This, this thing here was just permittivity. They play the same role right here between this permittivity and this C sub P. Sort of the same role, right? You, you don't see a one-to-one -one correspondence between these, right? And the capacitor, it's not a volume thing. It's more an area of overlap within the distance uh, between the bottom of that structure and, and some plate that, where it's forming the capacitance. But, you know, in, in the uh, mechanical sense, it's volume that you care about. The bigger something is, the larger thermal capacitance, and that should make some sense because when we think about what thermal capacitance is, it is performing the same function as the electrical capacitance. It is energy storage, okay? So the equivalent to a capacitor in the electrical domain but in the mechanical domain is volume and mass density, okay? This is, this is giving us a method by which we can store thermal energy, okay? And it's all pretty much the same thing, right? We shouldn't even be working in terms of electrical and thermal, we should be working in terms of energy and energy flow, right? Because that's all anything really is, and that's what ties everything together. So that's why it doesn't matter whether you're an ME or an EE here, right? We're all sort of working with exactly the same math. If you look at Newton's equations and Maxwell's equations, they look fairly similar, right? And so that, that tells you that you're going to be able to go from current to velocity, from voltage to force, right? You're just going to be able to interchange those things, and the math pretty much remains the same. Uh, so you know a hell of a lot already to be able to do all these different problems we're about to do. All right, so that's capacitance. Not quite a one-to-one -one sort of thing, okay? And if you're looking for a one-to-one -one sort of thing, well, here it is, okay? In thermal resistance, It's all very, very similar here. So thermal resistance, which I'll call RTH, is just going to be equal to length divided by K divided by area. Okay, so that's length. K is the thermal conductivity. That's a constant. A, of course, is the cross-sectional area. Okay, so with all of this, right, you have a thermal capacitance, a thermal resistance. This is all we're going to use to model this mechanical system. And it may look like a complicated mechanical system. But we're going to take all its complexity and simplify it into just these elements, and it's all going to come down to just one capacitor and one resistor. Okay, that's the power of electrical engineering circuit design, right? Electrical engineers use it all the time with transistor circuits and everything. I don't know if mechanical engineers use it as much. My history in this class says no, but by the time you're done with this class, you'll be using it left and right, right? Because it makes everything a lot easier. It allows you to deal with large numbers of things with utter simplicity. Okay, so let's do this now. Let's backtrack a bit and go forward a bit on this one and back on this one. And let's get back to this. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to create the thermal circuit that corresponds to this physical object. Okay, and I want the thermal circuit. So how am I going to do this? So one, I want to see where my power source is. So there's my power source right there. It's that, that, that spiral, or not spiral, but meandering line, right, that, that represents the sort of resistance that I'm going to use to joule heat this thing. So to heat this, I'm going to push a current down this thing, and like a light bulb, it's going to heat this thing up. Okay? And so how, do I'm, how am I going to uh, model that power? Well, that's one thing I haven't told you yet, but I'll show you right now. That power in a thermal circuit can be modeled by a current source. Okay? So that's power, uh, which is going to be equal to I squared times the electrical resistance of the wire. And so I squared being this current that I'm shoving through that wire, okay, and the electrical resistance being the resistance of that wire. Okay, that's electrical. When I have an R sub E, that means electrical. Okay, I gotta tell you that because I'm gonna have some RTHs all over the place here. 
Okay, so that power is pretty much going into the center of that atomic cell, right, which is a massive mechanical object. So it's going to have a thermal capacitance associated with it, right? And so where is my thermal capacitance going to be? Well, it's going to be in shunt with that current source, right? Because with that current source in the electrical domain, it looks like I'm charging up that capacitor. Well, that's the same thing as putting energy into that massive atomic cell, okay? So this current is going into that capacitor, and this capacitor I'm going to call CTH of the cell. And I'm just lumping all that capacitor into one thing. Is it right of me to lump it all into one thing? It's an approximation for me to do that, okay? I could, if I wanted, split this thing up into smaller sections of, thi of stuff, right, to get a more accurate result. Why am I not doing that? It's because I'm a lazy bum, okay? And you also should be a lazy bum at some point in this, right? You, you could divide this up into as many little sections as you want, right? And at some point, the gains of doing that is there's going to be no good returns on that, right? You can do a lot of work for nothing because you get the same answer as a lazy bum answer, right? So this is constructive laziness is what this is, right? I think circuit designers are used to constructive laziness. Right? Because in circuit design, at least when I teach these classes, uh, I tell everyone, if you're within 10%, you're, you're good. Right? That's the right answer. You don't have to have the right answer. You could be within 10%, you're fine. Right? Why is that? It's because when you design with transistors, you have different gains of transistors, different uh, GMs and that sort of thing. You can't control your process exactly. So in transistor level circuit design, you rely on the fact that things are sort of where they need to be, but your circuit sort of shoves it to where they need to be. Okay, you use circuit design to get what you really want. Okay, in mechanical engineering, I think there's a little less of that. So I think the MEs, you just have to get used to being a little looser with your numbers. Physicists are the same way, right? If you're in EE physics, like, like optics guys, you probably want very accurate things, right? Time to let go of some of that. Right? When you're dealing with a big circuit, you cannot hold on to the exactitudes. I call them exactitudes. Right? You're an attitude of being too exact. And if you do that, you're going to take too long to solve a problem. And you could spend all that time solving it. You may be 1%, 2% better than the, the other person's answer, but you took a longer time to get there. You didn't get the intuition fast enough. Okay? So learn to make approximations, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'll do it the whole semester, and hopefully by the end of the semester, it doesn't bother you too much. Okay, now the one thing that people don't like when I do these approximations, and I will agree with that, is that uh, it's tough to tell when the approximation you're making is correct or not. Okay, and for that, there's no way to tell you what's correct and what's not. You have to learn it yourself. Okay, so I guess what I will say is that when you're doing your homework, do not be as exact as you want. Okay, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and waste time, right? That's what the homework is for. It's there to waste your time so that you can learn something. And in the end, you'll learn, really, that there is never any wasted time, right? If you spend the time on it and you learn that you shouldn't have done that, boy, you're not going to do it again. Whereas someone who never did it, maybe next time we'll do it, right? And we'll waste their time. Okay, so it's good to waste time, but I'm not going to do it in lecture. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make these approximations. So here's a big approximation I'm about to make. I've got four feet. Okay, what I really ought to do is maybe say, okay, there's some resistance to that one, some resistance to that one, resistance to that. I'm not going to do that. And I'm just going to say, okay, this is my point of heat. I got one resistor that way, and I got one resistor that way. Okay, and I'm going to finish it that way. So this is my thermal resistance of my cell divided by two, more thermal resistance of my cell divided by two. And so this thermal resistance corresponds to in my cell, sort of that resistance that then goes to those two, two uh, uh, feet there. So that thermal resistance is that thermal resistance. And I got another one going in that direction that corresponds to that. Okay? So one to one correspondence, and I am making an approximation here. How good an approximation is it? May not be the best in the world, but you know, if I want just a back of the envelope type of number, uh, then it's good enough for me. Okay, so I've got that resistance now going to these two feet, which you can see I've shorted there together uh, from a thermal circuit standpoint. Now these two feet, they're going to have a thermal resistance and a thermal capacitance too. 
right? And so each of those two feet, I'm going to model the same way. So here's foot number one, two thermal, or thermal resistors with a thermal capacitance. Okay, so that's RTH of a foot divided by two. This is RTH of another foot divided by two, and this is CTH of one of the feet. Okay? And so I have yet another foot, of course, that I'm just going to draw right here. I'm not going to label that. On the other side, I have even more feet. Two more feet, to be exact. And I'm also modeling them by these T-network circuits. Okay? So I've created this circuit that sort of one-to-one -one correspondence with the different, uh, um, the different physical features that you're seeing up there. So let me draw this one-to-one -one correspondence with that foot there, and so on and so forth with these. Okay? So I've made a little thermal circuit for this whole thing, and now I want to, uh, let's see, I have to tell you where I'm going. So when I make a little star like this, and I do this, and then I go to the other side and the star is there, <laughs> that's a continuation of that point. Okay, so when you look at the notes later on, just look for the stars and find out where the other star is, and that, that's where I went. Okay, so what do I want to do? I don't like this circuit, right? I just told you that this whole circuit thing is going to simplify the problem. Well, that doesn't look simple to me. Right? Does that look simple to you? No. Okay, so we're going to start simplifying this. Okay, and here's where those who don't like approximations will really be bothered by what I'm about to do. Okay, so this cell, take a look at the size of this cell. At least the way that I've drawn it right here, the cell looks a lot bigger than all these little feet. Okay? And it is a lot bigger than all these little feet. And so that means its thermal capacitance should be a lot bigger than the thermal capacitance of the feet. I guess I'm thinking to myself when I actually plug in numbers whether that actually is true, because I think I made the feet kind of big in my numbers. But for now, <laughs> just, just look, right, if, if you could tell that the thermal capacitance of your feet is a lot smaller than that of the cell, then why are you going to just play with the thermal capacitance of the feet? Right? That's not there as far as I'm, neither is that. Neither is that, neither is that. I'm just going to eliminate these from the analysis because the thermal capacitance of the feet is a lot smaller than that of the cell. Okay, so I guess I have to do this kind of thing too, don't I? Neglect the thermal capacitance of the feet uh, because the feet are much smaller than the cell. Okay? Yes? Well, the thing is, they're shielded from that ca the, the capacitor by all these resistors, so you can't really just throw them in that easily, right? So it is easier to neglect them, as I'll show. Because once I neglect this, then I can combine these two resistors together. They become one resistor. These are resistors in parallel. Boom, everything just shrinks to something very small very quickly, OK? I guess before going on with this, let me say a couple things about this circuit that I kind of forgot to say as well. So this power. I guess I said it, but I want to write it down. So power in this circuit is analogous to, to current in an electrical circuit. Okay, voltage in this circuit, that's the same as temperature. Okay, so if I found the voltage at this point right here, I found the temperature. So we're just going to do, we're going to solve this circuit, but instead of getting a voltage out of this, we're going to get a temperature. So temperature is voltage. Yes, yeah, that's right. So the reference right here 
Thank you. Yeah, that's important. I should say right here, this represents T is 25 degrees C. I guess I call that T naught. Okay? And so this is temperature T reference to that uh, T naught. All right, so I don't like this circuit, so I am simplifying it. And so when I get rid of those capacitors, what do I end up with? I end up with the following circuit. So right, these two resistors come together to create one thermal resistance of a single foot. I have two of those in parallel, so this ends up being the thermal resistance of a foot divided by two. Okay, I have this resistor still there. So this is the thermal resistance of the cell divided by two. I have the cell capacitance right here. That's the thermal capacitance of the cell. I have the uh, power going into this. I guess I put that the wrong direction. And then on the other side, an identical thing because it's pretty much a symmetrical problem. Okay, so that's now my thermal circuit, but ooh, look at this. This is still not as simplified as it could be. I can reduce this one more step. So let's do it. And so now I finally reduce it to just this. Here's my power, which is current in this case, going into a single capacitor. That's my CTH of the cell. And then finally going into a single resistor where I'm combining all of the resistors from the previous circuit into a single RTH. That's going to be equal now to one half of RTH of a foot divided by two plus RTH of the cell divided by two. So just very simple circuit analysis to do this. Right? I know that my ground here represents T naught is 25 degrees C. And I know that this voltage here represents T. And so I could just say that the temperature difference instead of potential difference between those two with a minus and plus the same way that I do voltages. So it really boils down to just an RC problem. Okay? And so everything can be modeled by exactly what you know about RC circuits. So for example, um, one thing that you know, right, because this is current, this behaves just like current, I could say that the delta T, the difference in temperature across that thermal resistor, RTH, that is T minus T naught. That's just going to be the current that's running into that resistor at steady state. Right, so this is a steady state equation that I'm writing times that resistance. Okay, so if I know the power that I'm putting into this system, and I know the thermal circuit, in particular the thermal resistance, I know the steady state temperature is going to be given just by this equation. It's a linear equation just like a linear resistor. Very, very simple. For the case of a conductive thermal circuit, right? If it's convective or radiation, then some nonlinearities come in. Okay, but those are things that we know how to handle as well. Okay, not only this, right? This is just steady state, right? What about time domain? If I wanted to predict how fast I can warm this thing up, Okay, then how am I going to do that? Well, I can plot temperature on one axis. That's supposed to be an infinity. So that's that means temperature at infinite time. Where time is along the x-axis here. Temperature is along the y-axis. Okay, so what's this going to look like? So at some time t naught, 
I'm going to turn my power on. And so up to T naught, this curve is going to be flat at room temperature T naught. And then I'm going to turn that power on. This is an RC circuit. So what's it going to look like? Exactly what you've seen many times before. It's just going to rise just like any RC circuit. Uh, the equation that dictates this curve here is basically delta T is equal to delta T final, which is that, oops, this distance here, times 1 minus E to the minus T minus T naught divided by tau, where tau is a time constant associated with all of this. And what do you think tau is? Thermal resistance times the thermal capacitance of the cell. Okay, so this is just the time constant that determines how fast T infinity can be achieved. And then everything just boils right down to solving these circuits. Right? Yes? As an analogy, is there an equivalent thermal inductance? Yeah, so there isn't actually a th an inductor type thing. There probably ought to be, but it's not a practical thing that people have been playing with all this time. It's usually just thermal capacitance, thermal resistance. There's all sorts of resistors. There's one for radiation, one for convection, one for conduction. Uh, but the inductor is not one of these things that really has been modeled, that, that needs to be modeled in a lot of these circuits so far. Okay. Um, but there probably is something out there that could be modeled more appropriately by the inductor. Uh, okay, so there's your thermal circuit. So now what I want to do is actually go through and find all of these thermal capacitance, thermal resistances, right? So the first part of the problem is determine your thermal circuit. The next part of the problem is figure out what is RTH, what is CTH, what are all those different things, and right, that's not necessarily an easy thing because we've got all these different geometries to play with here. Okay, so let's go back and find some of these quantities. So find first the thermal capacitance of the cell. Okay, well we know what thermal capacitance is, right? It's just volume and density and specific heat in that equation that I gave you. So the first thing you have to do is find the cell volume. Okay, well finding the cell volume as you'll expect is a geometry problem. So there's my cell. Right, it's a box, but inside this box we cut out a little hole. And we cut out a little cylinder in this box. That's a horrible drawing that I just made there. <laughs> but we'll work with it. Um, we know the dimensions here, right? This L is three centimeters. This H, also three centimeters. This width, three centimeters. And I don't know if I gave you the uh, dimensions of the uh, cylinder, but that has a radius of one centimeter, that cylinder, and it has a length I'll call it length tube of two centimeters. Right, so to get the volume of this cell, it's just simple geometry. The volume of the cell is going to be the volume of the uh, block, the box that contains that cylinder minus the volume of that cylinder, which is just going to be pi times the radius of the tube squared. I guess I should say radius of tube down here. Um, hopefully you can read everything that I write later on. Uh, times uh, the length of the tube to get that volume. Okay, and so we could just plug in numbers here. So. Uh, if you plug in your numbers, what you find is that you get 20.7 cubic centimeters as your volume, right? And so to, to determine your thermal capacitance 
of your cell. So again, that's going to be the density of the material, which we said was glass, times that volume of the cell, times the specific heat of the material. So that again is specific heat, uh, which is glass material. So that ends up being 2,500, and I'm going to put the units in so you can see all this, kilograms per meters cubed, that's density, uh, times now a uh, dimensional change here, 1,000 grams per kilogram, times another dimensional change, 1 over 100 cubed, times meters cubed divided by centimeters cubed. I'm making these dimensional changes because the constants that I give you are in very specific dimensions. Times this 20.7 cubic centimeters, uh, times finally 0 0.5 five joule per gram kilogram. You see all the things that cancel out and you end up with a final cell capacitance of 25.9 joule per Kelvin. Okay? So very quickly like that we determine what the capacitance of that cell is, but it becomes a geometry problem, right? Different than electrical. Like I said, electrical capacitance is a geometry problem too. Uh, but this is just one that involves volume and that sort. Okay, so we're, uh, we're out of time, so uh, let's adjourn now, and we'll continue this uh, on Monday. Sorry, on Tuesday.